This is the video for section 1.4 of a student's guide to the Schrodinger equation. This one's about complex numbers, vectors, and functions. In the previous section, we spent a fair amount of time establishing the connection between vectors, abstract vectors, and functions. But when we get to the Schrodinger equation, you're going to notice something interesting. The Schrodinger equation includes the imaginary unit, i, the square root of minus 1. That means that its solutions may be complex. So, in this section, it's going to be a quick review of complex numbers and how they work specifically in the inner product. As you probably remember, complex numbers can be written like this. Z is a complex number, consists of a real part X, and in this case, the imaginary part is designated Y. The I is the square root of minus 1, as I said. First thing to understand, as it says here, is imaginary numbers are every bit as real as real numbers. They just lie along a different number line. You can see that here if you draw what's called the complex plane. There's the real number line, usually drawn horizontally. There's the imaginary number line, usually drawn vertically. So when you plot a complex number on the complex plane, here's z equals x plus i y. You go along the horizontal axis, a distance given by the real part, and then you go in the vertical direction by an amount given by the imaginary part. But if you want to know what is the magnitude or norm or length or distance from the origin to z, you have to be a little aware that complex numbers work differently. Look at what happens if I just try to apply the Pythagorean theorem, which says z squared should be x squared plus y squared. But if I take z and write it as x plus i y and try to just multiply that by itself, look at what I get. I do get an x squared, but the y squared is subtracted because of these pesky i's, and you get this cross term, which is actually imaginary. Well, we don't want a distance or a length or a norm to potentially be negative, and certainly we don't want it to be complex, so we have a different way of squaring. We call it the magnitude squared, and that involves taking the complex conjugate of z. That means that you change the sign of all the imaginary terms. Notice this used to be x plus iy. The complex conjugate of z is x minus iy. And what good does that do? Now look at what happens when we make the magnitude squared of z. It's x plus iy times x minus iy. These cross terms go away, and that i times i multiplication now has a minus sign included, so it comes back to plus, and you get exactly what you'd hope for from the Pythagorean theorem, x squared plus y squared. And the same thing works for vectors. Here's the magnitude of vector a. Notice we don't just multiply ax by ax, and ay by ay, and az by az. We take the complex conjugate before we do that multiplication. So this gives us the norm of vector a. Same thing for functions. Here's the magnitude or norm of function x. Notice this is an inner product in here. That means we're going to take the complex conjugate of the first member. And there you see it. Then we integrate, take the square root. That's the norm of f. Also works if you have two different vectors or functions, a dot b. This is the inner product between a and b. Notice the first one, complex conjugate. Inner product of f and g, f gets complex conjugated. This does have one interesting result, though. Look at what happens if I take a dot b, make the complex conjugate, add them up. The result is the complex conjugate if I reverse the order, if I had taken b dot a, you can follow through the steps of how we got there, but it essentially says you have to pay attention to the order. Since you're going to take the complex conjugate of the first member and not the second, if you switch that order, you're going to get as a result the complex conjugate of the result you would have gotten had you not switched the order. Same thing for functions here. Here we did complex conjugate of f. You can see that's equal to that. And that means it's the complex conjugate of the inner product of g and f in that order. So just be aware of that if you haven't run into inner products with complex abstract vectors or functions. There's a little warning here that your quantum book, or if you're reading something online, you may find that some authors take the complex conjugate of the second member of the inner product. That's not extremely common, but you should be aware that some authors do that. Okay, the main ideas of this section, fairly straightforward. Abstract vectors and functions can have complex values to them. If you take an inner product involving those, you have to remember 
to take the complex conjugate of the first member before you form the product. That way, you can be sure that the norm is going to come out real and positive. Relevance to quantum mechanics? The solutions to the Schrodinger equation may be complex. So if you're going to find the norm of them, you've got to take the complex conjugate when you do the inner product. Okay, that's it for this section. Next section, 1.5, all about orthogonal functions.